He's, the father's business is more correcting and the grandfather's more just, everything's good, it's okay, no problem. So we're all very fortunate. And for some of you, us here, he is your great-grandfather and Prabhupada's your grandfather, so you got the double blessings. Anyway, I'm just going to... Um, Om Ajnanti Marandasya Kinanjana Salakaya Chakshoru Militam Jaina Tasmai Shri Gurve Namaha Sri Chaitanya Mano Bishtam Stapitam Jaina Bhutale Swayam Rupakadamaya Nandati Swapadati Kama Vande Ham Shri Guru Shri Yata Parakamala Shri Guru Vaishnava Shri Shri Rupam Sagatata Sahagana Parivatam Vitam Sahitam Sadvaitam Shadutam Parijina Sahita Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shidar Krishna Padam Sahagana Tadita Shri Satam Vitam Shah Hey Krishna Kadana Sindhu Dina Gavanda Vigarate Gopisha Gopika Kanta Rada Kanta Namosate Tata Kanchana Gauranga Radhi Vidavadeshwade Vishitam Sutadevi Pranamani Haribiye Vancha kapa tarupya scha, kripa sindhu beheva cha, patitana pavanebhyo, vaishnavebhyo, namo namaha. And I'm looking now for his. Okay, so, namo vishnamadaya krishna masai bhutale, shimati bhakti vinanta swami kiti namane, namaste sarasati deve, gauravani pachani nivasesha sunyavadi paskata, and we will say these prayers together at the Pushpanthali. These are the pranams to Bhakti Siddhanta Prabhupada. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Oh, this is Bhakti I'm sorry. I thought this was uh, um, Okay, so here. This is not what I thought. Where would it be then? On the on the big book, volume one. Yeah. In the beginning, is there? Okay, thanks. I knew one. I, I know I have just about everything you could possibly need, but I'm sure there's still much more. Um, it's in the front here. Yeah. Somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And these are about even other prayers. Okay. All right, here. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shimati Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Namah Shri Varshaban Navi Devi Dai Taya Kripa Daya Krishna Sambandha Vigyana Dayane Prabhava Namaha Madhur Yojvala Prema Ja Shri Rupa Nuga Bhakti Da Shri Gora Karuna Shakti Shakti Vikraha Namostate Namaste Gora Vani Shri Murtaye Dina Tarane Rupa Virudha Pasadanta Vanta Hadine The English translation is I salute him who is known in this world as his Divine Grace Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Goswami Prabhupada, who is the same status as Lord Vishnu and is the most dear to Lord Krishna. I offer homage to him whose eternal identity is Sri Vishibhanavi Devi Daite. Uh, and in parentheses it says, one very dear to Srimati Radharani, the daughter of Maharaj Vishibhanu who is powerful as, who is powerful, an ocean of transcendental mercy, a deliverer of the science of Krishna, a co-giver of Srila Rupa Goswami's treasure uh, of bhakti, which is replete with divine love of Radha and Krishna. I bow to you, the very form of Lord Chaitanya's mercy's potency. I offer homage to you, the manifestation of Lord Chaitanya's work, the servant, the savior of fallen souls and the remover of the darkness of ignorance, 
of incorrect conclusions that oppose the teachings of Srila Rupa Goswami. Yes, so, uh, so I, I'm going to start by just mentioning that in 1975, and I believe it was March 2nd, I had the great opportunity to uh, observe, observe Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Prabhupada's observe, uh, appearance day with uh, Srila Prabhupada when he came to Atlanta. And um, uh, he had us construct a Vyasa sign next to his, which was um, one inch taller. We had extra marble because we had just moved to another temple. So the marble was all there from uh, a previous altar. And um, we had this huge six foot painting that's still there now behind Prabhupada, of Bhakti Siddhanta Prabhupada. And, um, there were some very interesting pastimes that took place during that uh, uh, ceremony. Some of them were quite funny, uh, uh, well known because of the humor involved in it. Um, and probably gave a very powerful lecture. Um, and the lectures here, I can read a little bit from it. But during the Arctic, first of all, I noticed the Prophet when he was offering the items to his spiritual master, uh, who was uh, like laser-like focus uh, on his, what he was offering. Every movement was extremely efficient. There was nothing um, extraneous. It was very focused, very deliberate, very concentrated, like a laser. And he was offering each item very sweetly, very calm very graceful. And then, at a certain point, we got to the offering of the water. And um, he's offering the water to Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. He's standing on his side of his... Um, no, he... Um, yeah, he was standing on his side of his Vyasa sign. And um, so that width. And then the other Vyasa sign uh, was oh, right next to it. And um, there was a Tosi plant in between the two of them. So he's offering over to this way. You know, I mean, well, he'd be facing like this. This is his Arctic, his Vyasa sign, and he's going like this. And so then he's offering the water. And. Um, they forgot to put a bowl for the for the uh, you know the little water that's in the concha. First, you're supposed to pour some into the bowl and turn around and offer the rest to the to the devotees. But there was no bowl there. <clears throat> you know, all the panic and everything. You know, there was three, four hundred. Um, a major portion of the Radhadamara party was there. The the library party was there. Devotees from as far as away as Toronto and the Caribbean, anybody anywhere who was out on the road doing traveling sankirtan, um, you know, they may they may have been in Seattle and they thought, well, we're on our way to uh, to Vancouver, but I think the best route is to go through Atlanta. So because Prabhupada was coming, people went out of their way to be there. So and because it was going to be an intimate. This is us, you know, we were a mid, medium-sized temple, and normally probably would go to places like Los Angeles, New York, London, in America, sometimes Chicago. Atlanta was not one of, he had passed through Atlanta once on his way to uh, Gainesville, and that was in 1971, I think. But he, he never left the airport. So, when we found out that he was coming, we had only been in the building I think we moved in in November, and the buildings were in very, very, you know, bad shape. One of the buildings hadn't been occupied. It was we had, and we had to gut so much and do so much to get it prepared. It was like a big thing. I mean, and and there was a lot of back and forth. 
you know, because there's a lot of politicking about Prabhupada's schedule. And there were devotees, even though Prabhupada said he wanted to go to Atlanta, there were devotees in Los Angeles saying, Prabhupada, there's really not much for you there, and there's so much work here with the press, and we need to get these things straightened out. And really, Prabhupada, we think you should come here. And then New York is saying something else, and, and so on and so forth. And now, now Prabhupada was on a tour that started in Dallas, then he went to Mexico City, and, uh, oh, and um, he went to Caracas, uh, that's where someone in the audience said, Shri Prabhupada, you know, there's Maya in this temple. And Prabhupada said, you show me a place where there's no Maya, and I'll take me there, I'll go there. Because there's Maya everywhere. <laughs> Everybody laughed. So, uh, then he went to as Prabhupada referred to it as Miami. It's too bad Lama Ganesh isn't here because he was there for that particular um, event. Um, and he had a very interesting pastime with Srila Prabhupada. Um, when Prabhupada actually came and sat down next to him on a bench, he was guarding. He was supposed to guard the perimeter of the property. It was, they were in Coconut Grove and they had a little compound. And at one point, he was listening to Prabhupada speak under a tree. But then he thought, he was standing in the back, and he thought, I'm not doing my service. So he decided uh, that he best, you know, pays the basis and continue doing his services. So then later that day, he happened to be sitting down on a bench. Uh, and all of a sudden, here comes Prabhupada, and he sits down next to him. And he's, and he, you know, he was like most of us, a rank and file devotee, not so much, you know, high profile. And now she will Prabhupada sitting next to you. And Prabhupada wanted to know during the class today. I noticed you were standing, and then you walked away. I was wondering why you left. And he said, well, Shri Prampa, um, my service was to protect the temple and the devotees. And while I was standing there, I realized I would love to have stayed to listen, but I thought, I'm not doing my service, so I should continue doing the service. And then Shri Prampa said to him, he like, like this, and he said, that is real here. You have understood correctly. Then he asked me some other questions about the service. I asked him if he was happy in his service and uh, like that. And I was mentioning yesterday that Jujahari told me, Jujahari Prabhu told me a similar story when he was in Mayapur. He had a similar service where he was protecting Mayapur and um, at night. He had a gun, and he would march the perimeter. And then one night, Prabhupada comes up to him. He, choked, he goes like this with his flashlight, and he sees Prabhupada. And Prabhupada, he pays and pays his and, and Prabhupada's saying, so, is it all right if I walk with you? <laughs> yes, Prabhupada, sure. Yeah. And then he starts asking him different questions about what he would do if something happened, and what is his, you know, where does he walk, and so on. So, he probably took interest in these things. Anyway, after he went to Miami, he came to Atlanta, and so, there was a big greeting and everything. Uh, so, back to the Arctic, I got off track there, I'm sorry. Um, that's, that's the result of not preparing for a class. So, um, uh, it was stream of consciousness. And, um, so Prabhupada's offering the water, and then he goes to put the water into the bowl, and there is no bowl. Mm -hmm. And so Balavant is standing right behind him. And I have a picture in my room that shows me like I was right over here. And um, Shurikirti was here. 
and the Paramahamsa was right near there too. And, and he turns, and there's hundreds of devotees, and it's complete, big kirtan going on, jumping up and down, and there was no way to communicate with anyone about anything. And so, and so Prabhupada turns back to Balavant and says, a bowl, I need a bowl. And he goes, a bowl? And he goes, yes, I need a bowl. And he goes, Haribo! 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 <laughs> the whole temple goes, Haribo! Haribo! <laughs> and Prabhupada looked at him, and you can see in his face he kind of couldn't understand what he was dealing with. <laughs> Disrespect. And uh, he it's the water conch, and as I mentioned, he's on the other side of the Vyasa side. And the Tulsi plant is in between his Vyasa sign and Bhakti Siddhanta's. So the entire breadth width of the Vyasa sign, he was standing over there, and Tulsi's like right there, and he just, with a flip of his wrist, just like this. It was so like graceful and almost poetic, and you just saw a stream of water in a perfect arch, and it just lands right into the plant. Not on the leaves, not on the plant, not off to the side, right into the soil. Not a drip <coughs> or drop was wasted. Perfect arch into the flower pot, <coughs> Tulsi. And then you, the place went crazy. <laughs> and um, he gave a very ecstatic lecture about Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Prabhupada. And um, I'll just read a little bit of it. But I got so many things, you know, I really wanted to study all this and put something together. But because, like I said, Colleen was in the hospital and I, I had to deal with that. and. Uh, I just so I brought the homework with me, and <laughs> I'm gonna read some of it. Um, I can pretty much remember it, but I just like to read some Prabhupada's actual words instead of me trying to do my recollection of it. So Prabhupada, and this was so in 1975, and he said this is an auspicious day, 101 years ago. So that would make it now it would make it 145 years ago because he was born. He appeared in 1874, so that would mean that today is his 145th celebration. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, he appeared on this day. So Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur is Gora Shakti. Gora Shakti means empowered, empowered by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he wanted his mission to be broadcast, and then Prabhupada turns aside and says, what is that sound? That's exactly what it says here. Because <laughs> there was a kitchen over there and they were going cut, cut. So that sound. All over the world he desired pravite ache yatta nagara digram savatra prachara hoive morana pravitre all over the world as many town and villages are there Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu predicted that his mission will spread. This prediction was made by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu personally 500 years ago. And, you know, one of the things is that, just to give an understanding, like, you know, right now we're experiencing a shortage of devotees because they've gone off to the Holy Dham, so everyone is having to step up a little bit more. Um, and maybe take on some more responsibility. And when I say that we had just moved into these buildings <clears throat> in November or something, and then we find out sometime in the middle of December that he's coming at the end of February. <clears throat> I mean, it would have taken us a year to accomplish what we accomplished in, say, six weeks. It was round the clock, and there was no... We had two shifts, two 12-hour shifts, hmm. and 
you know, you hear devotees talk about these things. And there's a nice uh, description of it by Bhavananda Prabhu uh, when, at one of the Rathiatras in San Francisco. And he says, all this, all of this work came out of one little storefront. They were building three carts. It manifested out of this one. And he said, there was no consideration of the, you know, whether you were wet or too hot or too cold or, you know, how many hours you've gone and who's doing what. You, you just, you just did everything. And it was all for Prabhupada. You were to please Prabhupada. When, you know, there's that famous little book that Mahamaya Prabhu wrote, um, Prabhupada is coming. That was the phrase. Prabhupada is coming! You heard that and boom. Everybody knew what that meant. You just dropped everything. Like, like right now, Jaipa Takamara was just to come. You know, there would be a certain energy centered towards, you know, pleasing this personality. So, we were really up against it. They actually had to tear out where the altar is there now in Atlanta, if you've ever been there. That was a separate room. They had to destroy a wall and we building permits, forget about it. I mean the city was watching us, but we were inside so we couldn't we got away with a lot. But we tore out the wall and built an all altar. But there was concrete coming in, being poured into the front room there to make the base of the of the altar, mm -hmm. and nobody complained. I mean, there's a devotee by the name of Bakula, who's still in the Atlanta area, comes to all the festivals, and his health is not good. But he said at one Panahati festival, he said, "I was there for like, you know, two, maybe three, four weeks." And I didn't even know there was a Mongol Arctic or, or anything until after Prabhupada had came and gone because they just had him working all night long. You know, the schedule, but he said what was good is at that time we were practicing for this play. So all day long he was hearing the pastime of the Chan Kazi. And he said that was just like being, you know, listening to a class on Chaitanya Charitamrita the whole day. You know, so, but he, the, you know, the schedule... You know, there was, we had Mangal Arctic and all that, and, and all the Arctics were being done, but there were people that were just there. He was new, he was a carpenter, and so um, his, his bhakti program was hammering nails. And um, so, so Prabhupada's preaching, and he's um, explaining how his Guru Maharaj, Bhakti Siddhanta, attempted to fulfill the desire of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And sometimes in the sometime in the year 1918, he was brahmachari and Bhaktivinoda Thakur, his material father. He wanted actually he wanted Bhaktivinoda Thakur. Of course, everybody wanted. So he had sent a book. Bhaktivinoda Thakur had sent a book in 1896 called the uh, Teachings and Precepts of Lord Chaitanya. He sent them all over the world to universities all over the world. Uh, one was sent to Montreal. One was in um, McGill University, I think in Toronto as well. And um, I heard one devotee in England recently, at the Manor, talking about that they found uh, one of his books in Oxford. Mm -hmm. and, said, and it even had, had a little handwritten note in there. And so his, the point is, is that what we have to understand is before Bhakti Vino, Lord Chaitanya's movement had fallen into great, um, you know, the followers of, uh, of Lord Chaitanya, after, after basically about a hundred years after the Goswamis had left, maybe 150 years after, it started, all these upper sampradayas start to form. I think there was as many as 11 or 12 Sahaja, Groups. They all had different philosophies. Some of them were quite, you know, um, sensuous, and and it was all about you know, the, because the philosophy. They weren't into the philosophy. They were into feeling good, and kirtan made you feel good. So they were just doing bhajans and then talking about the intimate pastimes of Radha and Krishna, and so Bhakti Vinodakur. He really studied 
the writings of the Goswamis and Krishna Das Kaviraj. And he began to translate them and present them because he wanted to establish the, uh, the philosophy and present this to the intelligentsia. Because at that point, the British and all the other ruling class, even uh, some of the ruling classes of the, amongst the Brahmins, they had found that the, the, the followers of Lord Chaitanya were what we would almost call hippies or something. You know, they were just kind of very loose. They were even uh, okay in some of the sampradayas to eat fish and to use intoxication. I was reading uh, um, late last night. And it was considered okay, you know, and that was one of the, one in Bengal and Orissa. So, Bhaktivinoda cleaned it up. And then he was praying to Lord Chaitanya for, I cannot do this. And he got the Lord Chaitanya's movement spread all throughout Bengal and made the attempt to get outreach. But he saw, listen to this, he actually envisioned that in Mayapur, the plains of Mayapur, which is a very, just, you know, rice paddies and wheat fields and, you know, little uh, grass huts, he envisioned a time when there would be Englishmen, American, French, Russian, they would all be there chanting the holy name. Now, okay, America at that point, the late 1800s, was a sleeping... They hadn't really come into their own. We were still isolationists until after World War, I, World War I. So who knew that America would be important at that time? England I could understand, because they were power, they were the Raj. And, and then um, the French, I mean, who, who were, you know, the French, they had not, nothing to do with that area. I mean, there was another country he mentioned that you can sort of understand, but it, it was such an outlandish, you know, pipe dream. But he actually envisioned this. He saw this. This is going to happen. And it is happening. It's actually happening. But why he knew about America being a great country, and that Russia and France and all these other countries would be involved. At that time, it was, well, in the late 1800s. Russia was still under the Tsar. I mean, th th this is, you know, something that just seems, how could he understand, it was like he understood the future of world um, political um, development. And then, but he could, he was limited, he could only go so far, so then he's praying for Lord Chaitanya for someone to help him. And he has... I don't remember the exact number of children, but it's like 10 or 12. And then uh, in 1874, Bhakti, on February 6th, um, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Prabhupada was, uh, took birth. Now, he was, uh, Bhakti Vinodha Kaur's father was the magistrate in charge of the district where Jagannath Puri was. And for some reason, that Yurtarath Yatra, the cart, got stuck in front of his house for three days and couldn't be moved. And um, at that point, his Bhakti Siddhanta's mother took the opportunity to put, to ask and to arrange, because her husband was the magistrate, and he was also managing uh, the Jagannath temple. and and. Uh, to put the infant Bhakti Siddhanta at the feet of Jagannath. And just at that moment, when he, they placed the baby, the garland from Jagannath, one of the garlands, fell mm -hmm. and garlanded his body. Mm -hmm. And this was considered a great omen. So Bhakti Vinod thought, now I have the, the son that I need. And so he pushed for Bhakti Siddhanta to become, you know, very and much educated. Now, Bhakti Siddhanta Prabhupada would go to these, he had no respect for the educational institutions and their way of educating people. But he would go to the classes, he would imbibe what they were trying to tell him. He didn't like the way they were teaching. He would imbibe it, and he would just, as soon as he walked out of the class, he would then just go off and study the scripture 
and, and engage in Harinam chanting. Mm -hmm. He wasn't interested. And he became an expert in speaking English and other languages. And his writings in English are so uh, erudite that most of us would need dictionaries to uh, be able to get through a paragraph. Because he's using words in a language that even the best uh, intelligentsia amongst the British even, and they, you know, are considered, you know, that's their language, we speak American, they speak English. And, um, and down here you speak whatever, from the south, I mean, Cajun? I don't know, what's that? <laughs> so, and, and then, you know, so he, um, he impressed everyone. And I want to give you an example, just a quick example. And apparently, I heard this recently, it was either in Sham Sunder's this shows you how much Colleen's been studying this book. She's got everything underlined. <laughs> you know, she's really trying to understand it. And um, look at that. She's yeah. really into it. So, the, uh, there's, a, there's a, a record that Prabhupada did called uh, the Hare Krishna Happening, the Happening Album, where he chants the Hare Krishna mantra. And then Prabhupada reads a paragraph written by Bhakti Siddhanta Prabhupada. Mm -hmm. and I either read it in Sham Sundar's book or I heard Sureshwara mention it that George Harrison had the record would play it over and over again. He and John Lennon were on, on a yacht in um, the Mediterranean around the Greek Isles and they were listening to the record over and over again and chanting. And, and George actually memorized this paragraph. I'm going to read it to you. Just, uh, you know, I'll read it so that you can you know, try to, you just let it wash over you. It's sort of like trying to understand Shakespeare. You just got to let the thing wash over you and maybe you'll catch it. The materialistic demino cannot possibly stretch to the transcendental autocrat who is ever inviting the fallen conditioned souls to associate with him through devotion or eternal serving mood. The phenomenal attractions are often found to tempt sentient beings to enjoy the variegated position which is opposed to undifferentiated monism. People are so much apt to indulge in transitory speculations, even when they are to educate themselves on a situation beyond their empiric area or experiencing jurisdiction. The esoteric aspect often knocks them to trace out eminence in their outward inspection of transitory and transformable things. This impulse moves them to fix the position of the eminent to an indeterminate impersonal entity, no clue of which could be discerned by moving earth and heaven through their organic senses. Yeah. So uh, that gives you uh, just a taste of... And the reason is, is that he where, where I'm, I'm, I brought up the point that up until Bhakti Vinod, you know, the, the Goswamis were writing um, very, um, these were the top intelligentsia of the time of Lord Chaitanya. Uh, Rupa and Sanatana Goswami spoke Persian, they spoke Arabic, they spoke, San they knew Sanskrit, they knew Bengali, um, and so they wrote all these books and translated scriptures and um, so this philosophy of Krishna consciousness even though it, it all comes down to the chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra it actually is um, is uh, the most uh, uh, elevated philosophy and explanation of who is the origin of creation? Way beyond any kind of sentimental, well, God is the Alpha and the Omega. God is great. Allah Akbar. You know, I mean, this tells us how great God is. And when you start to read the Nectar Devotion and all the different subtle relationships that there are with Krishna, and how, and then in the uh, Brahman Sanghita and in the description of the spiritual world. Where is, you know, when we were growing up, like as 
as in my, in my family as Catholics, you know, okay, it, we were very clear that Jesus was the Son of God, although now that's confusing to people, and there was a Father, but we didn't know what the Father looked like. We didn't know what it was like to go to heaven. Do I just sit on a cloud and play a harp and sing hymns all day? And is God an old man with a beard? Actually, one of Vishnu Tattvas is a Dvaitacharya. So if you want uh, a God with a, a white beard, a Dvaitacharya is your God. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, I don't mean that to be, you know, but it's, uh, everything is there. And um, so, but then the, that stage where they're just kind of like, uh, oh, it feels so good to just chant, don't, don't worry. And it's chant and be happy. And they're very, very decadent. So now Bhakti Vinod says, no, this, this, chanting is very important. And you have to develop a taste for chanting. But this, there is philosophy and we need to attract the intelligentsia. Just like you can understand then why Prabhupada pushed so much for the Bhaktivedanta Institute and to defeat the scientists. Because, you know, this philosophy is meant for the leaders of society and it's meant for all living entities. It doesn't matter whether you're uh, well educated whether you're very wealthy or you're, you know, working in the fields or you're a garbage man or you, you're illiterate, none of that matters. What matters is um, that um, the leaders of the society are helping you to understand that this life is transitory and that this life is meant for something more than just being a consumer just earning enough money to put, you know, to get a bigger house, to get more toys, mm -hmm. you know, just manufacturing, coming up with new innovations, like the man who came up with the concept of um, planned obsolescence, he's a genius. Mm -hmm. They used to make things in America that lasted, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. So I, I have trouble now even understanding the concept that when I buy something, it's not going to last the next 40 or 50 years. And they say this, but so openly that this is what makes the economy go round. I know, they, they're proud of it. They think this is very, this is intelligent. This man has won all kinds of awards. It's brilliant. I mean, we just bought a washing machine, right? In September. And first of all, they changed the stuff with the brand. And they say, yeah, well, Whirlpool, Mag, too, it's Mag, uh, Mag, Maytag, Whirlpool, the same company, different, you know, whatever. Okay, so I knew that was a con job. But, and then they wanted the, you know, you got a one year warranty, that's it? And they said, you can buy a five year, it's actually a four year, I'll make it with the one, I'll make it five year, for an extra hundred and twenty dollars. And I'm thinking, this is a scam, you know? They know that it's but coming, it's just, I buy the extra warranty. It's already sounding like the one I just had to get a new one for. Mm. Already. And it's not, I bought it in September. And that, that's, anyway, that's not, you know, complaining about, but nothing is permanent anyway in this material world, but, you know, I'm really attached to like having, you know, I, I get a jacket or a pair of jeans, those things are sticking with me. <laughs> you know, they're part of me now. <laughs> Don't, and, and, but, you know, when, the cars that we used to get, you know, but that's what, at least, you know, like these, some of these cars now, you get a warranty up to 100,000 miles. That's unbelievable. But it should be much greater. The, you know that when the for, first um, Model T's came out, those things, there were so few moving actual parts. First of all, you could fix them yourself, but they would last, you know. That, that was one of the problems, that they, they didn't need new ones. There was some still working in the 20s and the 30s, and they were originally made in the early part of the 1900s. They never changed the model for like 15 or 18 years. Then someone came up with the idea, let's change the model, a new style, every year, or maybe every few years, then every year. 
And I can remember as a kid, I lived right near a, a Ford dealership. And sometime around September, the next year model would be coming out and had them all wrapped up and we'd be trying to see what it looked like. Did it have fins? Did it have bigger fins? Smaller fins? You know, what was it going to be? They had this new thing called a Edsel. <laughs> 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 then there was a the Mustang and the T-Bird, you know, so... But those cars, those, those Model Ts, those things were still, you know, I, I guarantee you right now, if you could have one and you know what you were doing, it would be just as good as anything. So, you know, they were, they were using them in World War I as Jeeps. Hmm. Um, so, back to um, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Prabhupada. So, um, he was known as the Nishringa Guru. When my bodies were walking down the street and they saw Bhakti Siddhanta or some of his followers, they would cross the street and walk on the other side. He was the Lion Guru. He was powerful. But yet he was also always discussing uh, in his prayers and his poems, um, you know, his lack of, uh, of humility and how proud he was of his mind. There's a beautiful, um, what time is it? Yeah, there's a beautiful um, poem. Before, oh, but I need to show you this. This is real, this is really. So, at one point, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, he's about, his, his guru, Gaur Kishore Das Babaji, and his father, Bhakti Vinod Thakur, they both depart the material world around the same time. And, Bhakti Siddhanta Prabhupada, I believe, had already chanted a billion rounds on the very same beads that his father had chanted a billion rounds. And he did that in the little hut. At first he didn't, I don't think he even had a hut. And then they built a hut. He was just standing with an umbrella for the sun and the rain. And then someone built a hut around him. And if it leaked, they, he just had an umbrella. And I, I think, I can't remember how many years, but it took quite a few years. His father had done the same thing. And so, but after Bhakti, after Bhakti Vinod and Gorkishore left, he fell into a, you might say, a dark night of the soul. He was, he felt unqualified. He began to wonder, where do I go for shelter? Where do I go for guidance? And he was feeling this way. And I don't know if you can all be able to see this picture, but this is a vision that he had. He wasn't asleep, but this is a vision that he had at the yoga pit. And if you can see it, I'm, I'm willing to pass it around if everyone wants, but this is Bhakti Siddhanta. This is Gorkishore Das Babaji. This is Bhakti Vinod. The Goswamis are here too. And then the Panchatapa. But I need to read to you what it is. They said to him, Saraswati, why are you worrying? Begin the task of establishing Sudha Bhakti. Distribute Gauravani universally. Expand service to Guru Nam, um, Goranam. Distep, dis, uh, Goranam, Goradam, and Gorakam. By the way, that means the, the holy name of Gora, the holy place of Gora, or where you're worshipping Gora and the desire of Lord Chaitanya. Um, with un unreached enthusiasm, broadcast Bhakti Siddhanta, we are eternally with you, ready to help, the support of unlimited people, immeasurable opulence, boundless scholarship, awaits the blessings to serve your mission. All will manifest when required. Come forward with full strength to distribute the message of Mahaprabhu's Prima Dharma throughout the globe. No worldly hindrance or menace, menace, menace will be able to obstruct this undertaking of yours. We are forever with you. And it is Gorkashore Das Babaji. It is Bhakti Vinod Thakur. It is the Six Goswamis. It is the Panchatattva that he sees, and they are saying this to him. Mm -hmm. At that moment, 
He has a couple of followers in the middle of an empty field. But they know that this is the yoga pit. This is the place that Lodzitani, because Bhaktivinoda had established that. They have no uh, resources. They have no respect. But he, in a short time, he established an institution. By the end of his life, there were 64 Gaudiya Mats in India, and there was one in England, one in Germany, and uh, I think one in Burma. And um, so, for, so, so it starts with Bhaktivinoda, and he gets it spread all throughout Bengal and Arisa. And he even sends books out to intelligentsia around the world. Even someone said, I think it was Sureshwar said, that uh, he sent, Bhaktivinoda that is, sent something to Thoreau. I think it was the Bhagavad Gita, but it was in Sanskrit. <laughs> And he really appreciated it, uh, but he said, um, I, I don't know Sanskrit, so, but thank you. And, but then we have a quote from Thoreau saying that he would read it. Uh, not that particular one, because it was in Sanskrit. But he was very aggressively trying to do outreach. Then Bhaktisiddhanta accomplishes you know, the next stage, which he spreads it all throughout India, fighting the caste Goswamis, fighting against the upper sampradayas, who were very powerful, there was a lot of them, and it was very complicated. Like right now, you ask, well, what does it mean to be rhythmic? What does it mean to be um, with, uh, you know, this group over here? What does it mean to be with that group? You know, it's starting to get a little confused, but he was able to deal with all of that. And he was allowing untouchables chanting. And he's the one who started Brahman initiation. There was no, before Bhakti Siddhanta, there was no second initiation. It was just Nam. Initiation is the chanting of the holy names. He was creating Brahmins. He was trying to send a message that it's not Brahmin by birth, but by quality. Everything that Prabhupada did in the West came from Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Prabhupada. Mm -hmm. The only reason. We are the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, instead of the Gaudiya Math, is because his God brothers, Prabhupada's God brothers, ignored him. They, were, they would send, there was different degrees, they, they would send their, you know, like, not condolences, awkward, but they would send uh, their words of appreciation and they would uh, wish him well but we have no money for you, we have no men for you. And he's, the whole time he's in New York in the beginning, he's writing to all of them. You have the facilities, you are expert in making money, you have the man, you this. And then even after he finally decides, I need to start my own institution, only because they never responded, he still, you see a picture of him sitting, with, uh, he had a Vyasa me that he's sitting here and uh, Sridhar Swami is sitting on the same seat. And he invites them all to the cornerstone lane of uh, the Mayapur temple. He was constantly telling them, I have men, I have men, I have buses, I have the books. The only thing I ask is that you distribute these books that I'm translating because I've studied the situation in the West and these are working. And I will give you all facility. You be gurus. You do our, our, our spiritual master's service. I've laid the foundation. You come and help. None of them took it up. But it's not that Prabhupada was just an egotistic uh, wanted to go off and start his own thing. He had to, in order to establish, you know, a non-profit religious organization and have an institution. And he couldn't go under the name Gordian Mouth. He had to go under it. So he started the International Society for Krishna Consciousness and he had no money. And he was at 26th Second Avenue in the East Village, which is right on the boundary, right across Houston Street, is the Bowery. <laughs> so this is the bottom of the barrel. 
and he's calling it an international society with a couple of, you know, spaced out, you know, acid heads and, you know, whatever. Not all of them are taking, but... But he, he too, first though, like Sureshwar said, he understood, that like in Bon Maharaj's case, is that he had a successful thing going in Germany, and he was, and fortunately for us, they understood the Nazi started to, because he was talking about the Aryans, and, uh, which means the most enlightened and self-realized. It doesn't mean the super race of the white, you know, fascist Nazis. And um, so when they found out that he was preaching that we're not these bodies, that's when they lost interest in him. And, and he was just about to meet with Himmler and Goebbels. So we're very fortunate that he got kicked out of Germany because they understood that he was preaching we're not the body, we're not Aryan. It, the, the body doesn't matter, it's the soul. Because they were all about the super race. The, and so, otherwise, we would have. <laughs> but, and in England, we had the, the famous story of Prabhupada saying that um, the Zetland Mar of Marquis, the Marquis of Zetland, or he was a Scotsman, and uh, he asked one of his god brothers, Can you make me a Brahmin? He said, Sure. He said, All you have to do is. Uh, no, no intoxication, no tea, um, no illicit sex, um, no meat eating, no gambling, and chant on these beads. I don't know if he said 16 rounds, he probably said something else. Because um, Gordy Mom for 64 rounds. And when he heard the four principles, he said, Impossible. That's impossible. That's why Prabhupada started with the chanting. That's what Suresh Rao was mentioning. I hadn't picked up on that before, but he started with the chanting first, he got them to get a taste for the chanting, and then gradually introduced it. They got attached to being, you know, in, in Prabhupada's association, they got attached to eating that special Krishna food, they loved this chanting and dancing. Personally, when I joined, uh, what the profile of Vizcon was, you went out, for six to eight hours a day in the streets doing Harinam. If you weren't an artist or a part of the, the book, because I was in Brooklyn, so the press was there then. So if you weren't involved in those things or Pajari work, you were out in the street doing Harinam and passing out BTGs. And so Pashadam, you did that sometimes 10 hours. And I, I, I was ready for it because it was just like, I'm singing and dancing in the street. This is fantastic. I mean, what better than this? And then, sometimes we go to colleges and we put on plays, and you get to talk to people. And then slowly, slowly, we started hearing rumors about these devotees named Keshava and Mahabudi. No, Maha, uh, Budi Manta, Budi Manta, in San Francisco, selling Krishna books. And that's when we... For me, that was fantastic, because the Krishna book really changed my life. And so, for a while there, I was number one distributor in the Brooklyn... Henry Street Temple, I would do 10 Krishna books a week. <laughs> it was the kind of thing, you go to a university, you sit down and talk, and you just tell them how much it changed your life, and then you got them to maybe give a donation. But that, that was the beginning and the, and the change. But so Prabhupada slowly introduced various things, and you know, what, what could be better than, I, I just think this is great. I'm going to be singing and dancing my whole life. People, I remember one time this, uh, these two older women walked by and this one devotee, they said, Why don't you get a job like us? Why don't you get a job? Why don't you get a job and get like us? Instead of just singing and dancing all day. And he goes, Because I don't want to be miserable like you. <laughs> that was great. I'll never forget it. So, <laughs> it's true. So, what, would, what if everybody was like you? Everybody be happy. <laughs> so, because this material world is a place of suffering. You suffer at the time of death, you suffer at the time of birth, and in between there's 
uh, a mixture of suffering and temporary, you know, not that much. You know, the suffering, the headache went away for a few minutes. So, yeah. Okay, hey, I'm happy. I'm not suffering. It's not exactly what you call happiness, it's just a lack of. So, Bhakti Siddhanta, I, 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 I'm going to try to tie this up so it makes sense. Um, Bhakti Siddhanta Swaraswati Prabhupada wrote many, very many books. There's a beautiful poem that actually Jaya Takamaraj wrote purports to, and it's called Vaishnava K. I don't have the book with me, but the poem is in the third body of this. I do have a copy of that Jaya book. And the Vaishnava K is what kind of a devotee are, am I? I'll read you a couple, of, just a couple of verses real quick. And the idea is though that if it wasn't for Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, and, and, and here's another thing I want to quickly make. There is an attempt right now to kind of minimize Srila Prabhupada's um, position in the sense that because Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Prabhupada was asking most of his disciples who could speak English to go to the West and preach. Prabhupada wasn't unique in that. Although he did say, Bhakti Siddhanta Prabhupada said that he will do more than all the rest of you. At that time he was not taken seriously. Although he did help finance, I think it was the, the temple in Prayag, the Gaudiamat there. And um, so he, but um, but the point, the difference is, so they're saying, oh, well, you know, he gave that instruction to everybody. He said, well, he wasn't any special than anyone else. You know, he gave everybody that instruction. The difference is, Prabhupada did it. Mm -hmm. They didn't. The Gaudiya Math went on for some time and still going on right now. And, and we, there are our brothers and we wish them all well. We hope them to be strong. I'm going to read a couple of verses from Vaishnava K. Well, who is a Vaishnava? Wicked mind, what kind of a Vaishnava are you? You show, you show, your show of chanting Harina in a solitary place is for false prestige, simply hypocrisy. Mundane prestige is like the hog stool. Do you know that such repute is an illusion cast by mind? What is the value of contemplating wealth and women day and night? All of that is temporary. Your wealth is the progenitor of material enjoyment. Use it to serve Madhava. You are not meant for uh, lust, whose only proprietor is Yadava, Krishna. The lust of women, it says. Uh, Ravana fought with Lord Ramachandra to gain the tree of worldly reputation. Yet, that apparent oasis was merely a mirage in the desert of the Lord's material potency. Be attached to the solid position of a Vaishnava. If you neglect worshipping the Lord from that position, you will attain hell. Why do you envy Vaishnavas and suffer torment by desiring the honor accorded them? Vaishnavas have left behind desires for worldly fame. The fame that automatically follows them is never a temporary worldly opulence. You can get the mood of that that this was his mood. So, he was very strong, he was like a lion, the Sringa Guru, but he was also very, very humble. And he was always, um, uh, there's, a, there's a real quick quote I can find in Rupa Vilas's book that talks about how he's, it's right over here, he talks about, it's, and, it, and it comes out of uh, Bhakti Vinod's Saran, uh, Saranagati, surrender. And then, it's right somewhere. Where is it? Not there. Sorry. I lost it. I got it here somewhere. Maybe it's here. Nope. It's, oh, here it is. I see it now. He says, uh, um, He's talking about um, being, um, I don't know, why isn't it coming up? 
This is the this is the difficulty of not being prepared. Oh, here they are. I am. This is actually Bhakti Vinod's words, and then he expounds on it. I am an impious sinner and have caused others great anxiety and trouble. I have never hesitated to perform sinful acts for my own enjoyment, devoid of all compassion, concerned only with my own selfish interests. I am remorseful seeing others happy. I am a perpetual liar, and the misery of others is a source of great pleasure for me. The material desires in my heart are unlimited. I am wrathful, devoid, devoted to false pride and arrogance, intoxicated by vanity and bewildered by worldly affairs. Envy and egotism are the ornaments I wear. Mm. Ruined by laziness and sleep, I resist all pious deeds, yet I, I am very active and enthusiastic to perform wicked acts. Mm. For worldly fame and reputation, I engage in the practice of deceitfulness. Thus I am destroyed by my own greed and am always lustful. A vile, wicked man such as this, rejected by godly people, a constant offender, I am, a source, I am such a person, devoid of all good works, forever inclined toward evil, worn out and wasted by various miseries, now in old age, deprived of all my success, means of success, humbled and poor. Bhaktivinoda submits, submits this tale of grief at the feet of the Supreme Lord. So Bhakti Siddhanta then says, look within, amend yourself, rather than pry into the frailties of others. In this world of Maya, the verse of the Lord, full of trials and tribulations. There's a word that's going to be used in the next three or four verses here. It says, and see if you can pick out the word. In this world of Maya, the verse of the Lord, full of trials and tribulation, only patience, humility and respect for others are our friends for Hari Bhajan. Lord, the Lord Gorasanda puts his devotees in various difficulties and associations to test their patience and strength of mind. Success depends on their good fortune. When faults in others misguide and delude you, have patience, introspect, find faults in yourself, know that others cannot harm you unless you harm yourself. So three times I said patience. patience. He talks about that. And then, you know, because in this age, some people attribute a certain period of enlightenment in uh, the last couple of centuries is the beginning of um, the drinking of coffee. And, you know, people would hang around the coffee houses and really get all worked up and have a lot of energy. Yeah, what about this idea? What about that? You know, and things became much more uh, intense and passionate, and you know, tea drinking like that. So, patience is that means then you're on Krishna's time. You're waiting for Krishna. You're not waiting, but you're serving Krishna, and you just things will unfold in His time. We don't force the sun to rise. The, the sun rises at, a, at a, its own assigned time mm -hmm. under the will of the Lord. We did, you know, you can't, like people say, oh well, Prabhupada came just at that right moment. But why did he come just at that right moment? Mm -hmm. He said, well, I, 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 I waited too long, I should have come sooner. But he came exactly at the right time. Mm -hmm. If you know the whole you know, uh, social situation that was going on in America at that time. Patience, you know, it's like tolerance, you know, to, and humility. We have to be patient with ourselves and patient with others, and not expect too much for, from others, and not expect too much you know, for ourselves. Krishna is there, he, he loves us, he's waiting for us, to completely, you know, make that commitment to fully surrender. And he's ready to give us the world. But we have to be qualified. We have to know what to do with it. The biggest, sometimes I've seen the biggest problems that we've had is when we've been successful. <laughs> and then when we're not successful, then we get angry and we get, and we get so, 
it's a, it's a process of learning. We're, I mean, I know for myself personally that I like start, you know, start with very, you know, seriously knowing my place is very insignificant. Go along, people are saying, oh, that's very good, you did good. Some reciprocation, start feeling good about yourself, build up, build up, build up. <coughs> and I gotta get humble again. And it's a constant stage of growing and growing and going through these cycles. And Bhakti Siddhanta's prayers help us to understand that. But the point is that Srila Prabhupada, he told us that Vani and Vapu, that he never felt separation from his spiritual master because he had the Vani, the instruction of his spiritual master. And it wasn't as important to be in the personal association of his Guru Maharaj. So, on the appearance day of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Prabhupada, um, we should follow in the footsteps of our founder Acharya Srila Prabhupada and follow the instructions of the previous Acharyas and with patience um, continue to work towards the goal of establishing uh, Lord Chaitanya's movement over the next 9500 years. I think that's what we got left. It's a lot of time. We got a lot of time. So, um, so then it slowly. We got a ten. You know, there's a ten thousand year period. Is it ninety five or hundred years? I said ninety five thousand years. Yeah. Ninety five hundred thousand or ninety five thousand years. Okay. So, thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> so. Um, patience and, um, and determination and following Prabhupada's footsteps. Things go by so quickly, so fast, it seems like just a few days ago that we were getting ready for Prabhupada to come to Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And then in other times, it looks like another lifetime ago. But um, he's here today and um, we're going to help him observe his um, Guru Puja of his spiritual master will assist Srila Prabhupada and help him to worship Bhakti Sinatha Saraswati Thakur, who is our grandfather's spiritual master. Does anyone have anything they'd like to add? So the program starts at 12 at the Arctic. Okay, so we're all in agreement, we're all on the same page. Okay, sorry for being all over the place. Um, anyway, but there's a lot of nectar when it comes to Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Prabhupada. Imagine him seeing the entire Panchatapa coming dancing towards him. Mm -hmm. That's pretty amazing. It's like Prabhupada in the boat. Yes, it's like, you, know. you know, just keep going. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I have to go to the pharmacy, get some medication for Kami. Okay, she won't know. She has pneumonia, yeah. Um, fortunately, it's not contagious. Um,